deeper to thoroughly grease and clean everything depending on how long you're out. Again, in my story, I'm out on the frontier for eight to 10 months uh, on the trek. So you're looking at a very extended period of time when you may or may not be around anyone who can repair that. And of course, your life often depends on it. Uh, also, of course, you carry extra beeswax. It's where you carry your fishing kit, uh, lead, bullet mold, uh, ladle, uh, a cup, a boiling pot and spoon. Um, also, your other items like chocolate, uh, which was a big thing on the frontier in the 18th century. They liked chocolate. Tea and coffee were also uh, something that people would drink. Uh, but chocolate was first, uh, coffee was a close second, and tea would have been kind of a, a distant third. But chocolate was preferred, and uh, also you could carry some sugar, other food items that you might wish uh, that you weren't carrying along in your, in your main kit. So that's kind of your, the idea behind your, your haversack and what you would carry in there. And a lot of it was individually based. Uh, depending on the, the length of the trip, depending on your expectations, how long you'd be gone, as I said, and also what you might encounter. So you would carry less going into a more uh, civilized area to hunt than what you would carry if you were truly on the very front edge of the frontier because you had to be a lot more sufficient in and of yourself. And of course, you would also want the skills and abilities to maintain your equipment as much as possible. So moving on to 18th century survival knowledge. Of course, there is nobody here from the 18th century that we can actually interview, but we have books and we have journals and we have things that people have left behind for us that gives an idea of what they faced. Now, one thing that is vastly different from today is the amount of game. Now, there were times when game was scarce. Of course, weather conditions, and depending on whether or not an area had been previously hunted, uh, how long a person or a group of people were in an area, because the longer you are in an area, the animals, of course, being much more keen in their senses than humans are uh, within just a short amount of time, the game will scatter uh, from the location of the camp. The campfire smells, the cooking of food, uh, the general din and conversation of people, uh, their, their smell, their sight, their hearing, uh, far beyond ours, and so, you would have to travel farther and farther the longer you were encamped in an area to find game. So uh, that's one interesting thing that we see even today on modern survival shows like Alone. Uh, they will often talk about in the first few days how much wildlife they see. But then toward the end of their stay, they've spread their scent everywhere. They've been chopping trees and building shelters. There's a lot of noise of human habitation occupation in the area. And it gets much, much harder at exactly the time when they really need it. Uh, your first two or three days, you're still doing okay. You're living, you have plenty of food in your body. You're, you know, you're not feeling the effects of starvation. About day 50 or 60, that's when you really want to take down that moose or when you really want to you know, find that squirrel or whatever. But by this time, you have so saturated the area with your presence. So they faced similar things in the 18th century, but there was more game because there were relatively fewer people. So a person could leave one area that was game poor and within just a few miles be into an area that was game rich. So that's, that's different. Uh, since about 1970, uh, roughly half, 50% of the vertebrate animals in the world uh, have died off. So, and, and that's just in the modern 20th century. So in the last 50 years, we've lost 50% roughly of vertebrate animals. Of course, those that have, have spines and vertebrae. And so, that, that is a big problem. It has to do with habitat encroachment. Uh, people are, are building over top of wetlands and uh, forcing, you know, just population pressure, forcing animals into smaller and smaller locations. So this is something that they understood and they would, they would want to go to a place where they could find adequate food. So they, they, had, they had an advantage in that after a few days you're going to have to eat, it was a little easier to find them than it is now. Um, people that are like, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go out into the, the wilderness and survive. Uh, well, remember uh, the site that we're standing on, right? They burnt 80 acres of corn. 800. 800. Okay. And by the way, Josh, it was a great presentation. 
So 800, sorry, I, I guess I didn't listen as well as I did. I got 10% of it. Because, as I said in the first presentation, corn had an immense value in the 18th century. It was a, it was a mainstay of survival, of life, of generally living. And remember, they lived here. This was their village. This is their area. They knew it. They hunted it. They were familiar with the, with the game and, and the habitat and, and the habits of the animals. They, they were people of their world, of their age, and yet they had 800 acres of corn. Because corn, I don't know if you know this or not, this is sort of one of those little secret things that, that you really need to put in your mind for survival, but corn doesn't run very fast. Okay? Okay. And so it's also a dense energy source, which is another reason why in a survival type situation, um, I know it sounds gross to a lot of people, but that's why you eat bugs, that's why you eat larva, that's why you try to find things that don't run fast or can't run far, even earthworms. It's a source of protein, it may not be the best protein in the world, but again, it's relatively easy to catch. Uh, and you can do that using uh, the things that we find in the resources. You can take a 10 foot by 10 foot area and you can boil down some walnut hulls and you can pour that walnut uh, juice on the ground and the earthworms will come up of themselves uh, and you can just pick them up off the ground. You can do the same thing to a, a pond or a lake with walnuts because of the, the toxin that's in there and it will stun the fish and you just walk in and you pick them up. Uh, there were things that they knew how to do, but they understood that you didn't do it every day. You would quickly depopulate the fish. You would quickly get rid of all of the earthworms, which are beneficial for the soil. But in a survival situation, they had these bits and pieces of survival knowledge that was tucked away to be used only if needed. But if that time came, they understood the roots, the berries, the times of year, the seasons when they were available. Of course, you can find cattails. There's something that's edible on a cattail every single season of the year. And so uh, just considered a, a wonderful resource if you're in an area where there are cattails. Of course, today we have to be careful about eating cattails. Uh, they need to come from an area that isn't polluted, like a bunch of farm agricultural or industrial runoff. And they didn't have those things back then other than perhaps a dead animal that was lying in a stream or some, you know, passed out and died in a pond, I mean, you would have that sort of pollution. So obviously bacterial infections were, were common, uh, but you could, you could see that. You know, if you walk up and you see something physically laying there in the water, you know, well, that's probably not safe. And they would understand that as well, it would make you sick. And so the first point that they would know as, as they're walking through is they, they were really big on finding good water. If they could find a spring, uh, was preferable because it came right from the heart of the earth and a lot of spring water is is because of the filtering process of the earth itself is very clean and pure. Uh, they preferred flowing water and not stagnant water, uh, so streams or springs, and they looked for what they would call sweet water. Some water tastes better than other water. We know that. Uh, we were just having a discussion a little bit earlier about bottled water. What's the best tasting bottled water? And probably if we would do a survey of the people that are in the room, uh, we might have difference of opinion over what's the best tasting water. Most people will agree that tap water is not that great. Uh, we were talking earlier about a Berkey filter and Berkey filters with the, 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 the Berkey system with the black filters takes out all kinds of stuff and it produces what they would have called in the 18th century sweet water. Really good tasting, nourishing water. When you drink it, it's not sugary sweet like we're getting ready to go down and, and watch Justin do some maple uh, syrup boiling down some sap. It's not that kind of sugary sweet, but there is, if you think about it, certain water as opposed to water that has uh, other contaminants in it, it does taste sweet in, in a certain sense, but not sugary sweet. So I think you understand that. Matter of fact, there are even places today like Sweetwater, Florida, right? Uh, there are different areas where you will still find locations that are named after the springs from that area. Another thing that they had in 18th century survival knowledge was a, a knowledge of being able to recognize and use plants and herbs. Uh, of course, this is something that you always need to learn from an expert um, and understand seasonality. Our ancestors lived seasonally. It was, we have, we've had some strawberries up here, uh, and it's February. 
That would have been absolutely unheard of in the 18th century to have strawberries in February because they don't grow in February. And, and you won't see that until later on. There's a reason why they're called June berries. Or, you know, we have the ever bearings, but they don't really ever bear. It's like an evergreen tree. Like they, they, they bear longer, but not again. So you would have very specific. So you would look for June and July specifically. That's when your raspberries and your blackberries and, and all of these things would start to come out. You look for your, your mulberries and things to start bearing heavily on the trees. And so they would, they would focus on those times. And they also... Um, were very conscious of the weather that had to do with the seasonality. Uh, a friend of mine that was working with some native tribes up in Canada, uh, they, they, of course, would have their work planned for the next day. But they would wake up in the morning, and they would look at the conditions around them, and they would say, you know what? Today's a good day to go fishing. Today we're going to fish. And so they would lay aside what they had planned originally because the atmospheric conditions and the weather were conducive to a good catch. And so they would, they would go and they would access and avail themselves of that opportunity. Plants and herbs, they used them for foods and medicines. Uh, was it Socrates that said, let your medicine be your food and let your food be your medicine? Because in other words, we understand that eating healthy, getting the right nutrients and vitamins and minerals are essential to staying healthy. And of course, our native ancestors not just the Native Americans, but our ancestors from Europe knew a lot about the natural things that would grow and they would use them for medications. They didn't have hospitals and nursing homes and, and all of the emergency room access, the personnel, and the doctors, and the scanning machines, and the labs. They didn't have any of that stuff. So they had to learn a lot of it probably by trial and error and also knowledge passed down for literally thousands of years and it's probably one of the greatest tragedies of the modern world is that we have absolutely, there's been a complete break between all of, I mean, we're talking thousands of years of ancestral knowledge passed generationally, and we have absolutely been cut off from it to where the average person walks out and looks in their yard or to the side of a hill, and they see green, they may see some flowers, they have absolutely no idea what any of, things, of those are for what they can be used, what the potentials are. They don't know if it's poisonous, they don't know if it's edible. Uh, they might hopefully have the sense to recognize that at least it's pretty before they go back to the smartphone. All right, I mean, there's, we, we, we live in a world where we are completely shut off. Our ancestors did not have that. They were not distracted by television and by a public education system that doesn't teach us how to think, it just tells us what to think. And so they, they had developed critical methods of thinking, of processing, of understanding. And so they were able, when they looked at something, they would recognize it, they would see what it was good for, they would take a mental note of where it's growing, the time of year, and because if you know anything about, even in this park area, there are certain areas where plants grow that do not grow in other areas. And so as you were making your trek through the wilderness in the 18th century, you would pay attention to where all of those, this is snake root, there's bone set, there's all of these things, right? And it grows here and it grows there and it might be four or five miles apart. But you know that when the time comes to gather those herbs, you would travel to those regions. You would, you would make a mental note of where that was. Also, they were very good at recognizing trees and their uses. Not only uh, the medicinal use, of course, but also for tools and as well as building shelters. They would understand that there are certain types of, of trees that make better purlins, for instance, for a cabin than other types of trees. Certain types of trees, uh, we, we, like white oak, for instance, makes, in this region, really good shingles. Whereas when you get out farther west, then you have a western cedar, which again, splits very good, very few knots in western red cedar. Makes really good shingles. And as a matter of fact, if you buy wooden shingles today, they probably will be western red cedar. But in this area, white oak was, was preferred. So you, you'll hear things like that. Uh, people really liked tulip poplar for log cabin logs. If you've ever seen tulip poplar, they grow really tall and really straight. Uh, they can get as high as 150 feet tall and they have a very interesting uh, shape of the leaf. Uh, sometimes it's called old lady's nightgown. 
Because if you look at it, it looks a little bit like an old lady's nightgown, the shape of the leaf, and it has like a tulip, kind of like a flower of a very short time in the spring. And it's extremely useful. For the, the bark makes great uh, shelter building materials. It's what I built my wiki up out of, was uh, tulip poplar bark on a, on a frame mostly of, of maple saplings. But then you also could make uh, large canoes out of the tulip poplar. They, they, would, they knew how to make a canoe in a day. They could strip the bark off of a tree. As a matter of fact, uh, Townsend's did a video on how to make a, a canoe in a day. And uh, just absolutely fascinating stuff. This is the knowledge they had. They came to a river that couldn't be forded. They would look for the proper tree, cut the bark off, begin to lay, stitch, and fold it together as while it was green. And, and by the end of the day, they would have a viable canoe. The next morning, they could cross the river. So these are the kind of skills that they understood they could look at. And, and the tulip poplar, the inner bark, when it's shredded and dry, is an absolutely fantastic fire starter. It's also a really great tree because it's tall and straight, up to 150 feet tall. And those long, straight logs are perfect for building cabins. So they understood trees, their uses, uh, how a person would access it, the best time of year. For instance, the best time to strip tulip poplar bark off is March, April, May, June. So the early part of the, the last part of, of spring and the first part of summer. So when the sap is flowing, you can, you can peel that bark off so easily. It's, it's a beautiful process when you get into it. So they understood the trees. They also had a knowledge of animals. Trapping, hunting, fishing, uh, snaring, of course. They understood their paths, their habitats, the seasonality, uh, when, when you could expect them to be out and about. They also understood that very frenetic activity before a storm. <laughs> so they would pay attention and they would be able to see that uh, these people were, uh, or that the animals rather, were getting ready with their nests, gathering nuts. Uh, one thing that they would notice about the squirrels. If the squirrels are really working hard to gather up nuts, probably going to be a hard winter. So they, and they didn't just take any one thing, right? Sometimes we will look at one thing, but they would look at the sun, the moon, the stars, the atmosphere. Uh, they knew things like if you wake up in the morning and there's a heavy dew on the ground, it's going to be fair weather today. If you wake up in the morning and there is no dew on the ground, it's possibly going to rain and maybe rain hard before the end of the day. It has to do with atmospheric conditions. But they could read. We read about them and, and, and they were reading sign. They might not have known letters. They may not have understood an alphabet. But they knew how to read. And they could read things that you and I, it, it, it almost seems uncanny the way that they could step out into their environment and tell you what was going on that was obvious to them. They were reading the signs. It was speaking to them. The birds and everything, they were, they were talking to them in, in a language they understood because from a child up, they had been heavily schooled. Because again, these were knowledge things that you had to have. They also understood how to read the weather as part of that, the wind direction, the clouds, the smell of the wind, the animal behavior from before storm, which I referred to. They, they knew how to observe. And, and this is something that we in the 21st century, the animals haven't really changed. Okay? The, the sun still shines. The wind still blows. The rain and the snow still falls. We have all of the same things that they had, but we don't recognize it. Uh, you know, a, a ring around the moon indicates a change of weather within the next 48 hours. And uh, as with the formation of ice crystals in the upper atmosphere, uh, forms a halo. We might know the science behind it, but very few people understand how to apply that anymore in any meaningful way. They also understood how to guess time. I was talking about this a little bit earlier. If they wanted to get up, say, 4 o'clock in the morning, they want to do an early morning pre-dawn raid, they knew that the Native Americans and even our ancestors, they didn't necessarily have alarm clocks. Not everybody owned a stopwatch or a, or a, or a uh, timepiece. And so they would drink a certain amount of water, and they knew before they went to bed how much water to drink. They had practiced this. Until they knew that if I drink this much water, or, you know, that I'm going to have to get up to go to the bathroom at 3 or 4 o'clock. 
It's only going to be three or four hours. If I go to bed at midnight, if I drink this whole bottle by 4 a.m., i got to get up and go. And they used their natural biological rhythms then as a clock. And they understood all of those elements of using their personal body. Um, for instance, if you hold your, your hand out at arm's length, many of you know this already, but each, each finger is worth 15 degrees of arc. And so if you are looking out at the horizon, you see the sun's going down, and you put your hands up like this, each finger is standing for 15 minutes. So my top finger here is touching the bottom of the sun, and my bottom finger is on the horizon. That means I have two hours before sunset. And you'll often read in the old books that two hands before sundown, they stop to make camp. You know why that was? Because that's two hours of time. It takes us that long to set up camp, get the firewood, get the fire going, and have everything done because, again, remember, they didn't have headlamps, they didn't have flashlights, uh, they didn't, maybe didn't necessarily, if, if they had a candle, it was saved for emergencies. Candles could be very expensive on the frontier. And so they, they would take use of the natural light. And so two hands before sundown. They knew how to guess time. Uh, they, of course, could use the shadow stick method. Uh, for telling direction, the passage of time, something like we do uh, with uh, a, a, a sundog. They also had knowledge of local tribes. So they understood not only their tribe, if they were natives, but also the surrounding tribes. There was a sign language, there was a communication. Many of our frontier ancestors, they had survival knowledge to communicate with sign language basic needs, desire, food, water, trade, and they would work all of these things out. And there was a system that was taught and that they had learned. And so they had this knowledge in them. I wonder in our modern world if we even know someone that lives on the next block from us. Much less even our next door neighbor. So we are so isolated. The survival knowledge they had was essential because if you didn't have something, just like we talked in the first session about having the fire pan and being able to run to the neighbor's house to get you know, a pan full of coals to bring back to your fireplace to restart your fire, um, just as in having that, they knew their neighbors because you depended on each other. It was a mutual benef mutually beneficial, mutually supporting uh, type thing. If, if your cabin was being attacked, they'd come to your aid and vice versa. Because, again, it was about survival. So they, they had this knowledge of the, of the local people, where they lived. Uh, were, were they renegades? Were they friendly? Were they friendly at a certain times? Were they friendly to the British? Were they friendly to the French? Uh, were they friendly toward white settlers in general? And, again, you had to know that stuff. And if you didn't know it, you tread very carefully in their area. They also benefited from generational knowledge and skills, which I alluded to earlier. One of the things that we are trying to do in my school and doing sessions like this and what you're trying to do here uh, through this organization is we are trying to generate interest and once again teach the values and the morals that made our country great, that made our people strong, that gave us good homes and good families and good churches and all of these things that, that held us together as, as people of, of faith and virtue uh, that could stand up against uh, tyranny and, and produce something worthwhile. And these are the things that we want to bring back into the forefront. And they, they've been pushed to the background as, as entertainment and, and values and morals that, that tend to disintegrate or denigrate people uh, and, and society have been pushed instead. And so our ancestors benefited from generational knowledge and skills. And I just want to encourage all of us, when you learn these things, teach them, pass them on, talk about them, teach them to your children. Uh, if you read, you know, even in the Bible, Moses, and the law of Moses, that's what he commanded. You teach this to your children, you pass it on. Uh, when you build this altar, you put up these stones. Later on, your children will say, what is the meaning of these stones? You tell the story. You relate the information. You give them the knowledge. And unfortunately, we've lost a lot of that. So they, they in their survival knowledge, this, this knowledge they inherited, they brought, now, I'm not talking about like in their DNA. I'm talking they actually knew things that they were taught by their fathers, and grandfathers, and by the way, think about this, they didn't have nursing homes. So when the elders got elderly, where they could no longer care for themselves, they were brought into the family home. And so now the entire family benefits. And you know how older people are. The older they get, the more they tell stories about their youth. And if they start 
reaching back into the old days. Well, when I was a kid, this is what we used to do with X, Y, and Z, right? And so the entire family would benefit from this person. And of course, they, they're feeling their own mortality. They, they want to pass on their story. They want to pass on their experiences before they go on. So they would pass this. All right. They also, in this 18th century survival knowledge, they had ax skills and understood how to use basic hand tools. Now, not everybody did. There were city dwellers. There were people who were very incompetent. You can read even on the frontier. There were people who came out and were an absolute failure and had to go back east. Uh, we, we read about the heroes. We read about the, the successful people who, who uh, you know, led the armies and fought the battles and built the cabins and the cities and towns and, and you know, drew the maps and, and all that. And, and that's it. You know, obviously, those are the people that, that get noted in the history books. So not everybody had all of these skills. Uh, by the way, not all the Native Americans had good survival skills either. And if you read from Lewis and Clark's journey, 1804 to 1806, you read during that, they encountered many tribes, and, and some of them were actually starving to death, uh, living in the very early 19th century, and with abundance of game, no white people around. You know, uh, Lewis and Clark and their expedition were the only white folks anywhere around, and yet... They were starving because times were hard, and uh, their hunters were able to take some deer in the one, in the one instance, and uh, the natives were so starved and so, so glad for it that they were eating the entrails. They, after gutting the animals, they, they asked permission if they could have the guts, and so the natives were eating the guts raw. Uh, they were literally so hungry. So sometimes we, we tend to glorify the past, but there were people back then that really struggled. And so those of us who are alive today, guess what? Your ancestors made it. And they had kids. And they produced you. So you literally are here because your ancestors survived the 18th century. Right? Because a lot of people don't know this, but having children is hereditary. If your parents didn't have any, you won't either. I'll take a little while to sink in. So your parents literally survived. And your grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, however far you want to go back, and that's why you're here today. They also understood in this basic knowledge survival skills, they understood basic flintlock care and use. And then 1804 is when the cap locks came out. Uh, of course, invented. They didn't catch on for probably about 30 years before it really became popular because you had to carry caps then or your, your rifle would shoot, which was kind of a problem if you were too far from civilization. You could always pick up an extra flint somewhere if, if you were out west. Um, but, uh, yeah, if your cap started or got wet, you know, you were in trouble. So, but they, they did have basic flintlock care and use skills. They understood how to maintain that. Even, even young boys uh, were sent out to hunt squirrels and rabbits and deer. And, and they were, you know, we, we often hear stories of the Great Depression, the 1930s in the United States, where uh, a young boy would be handed, you know, five 22 shells and, and the 22 rifle. And you, you had to bring back five squirrels or five rabbits. Every shot had to count because there wasn't money to just go and waste on ammunition. We see the very same thing in the 18th century. The young boys were expected to be able to do that. And of course, if you go far enough back with the natives, uh, Justin and I were talking about that they, when they excavated some of the, the uh, tribes uh, that they were, as they dug up the graves right here in Ohio, uh, exhumed some of them and, you know, I guess were moving or doing some sort of a digging and they came upon them. So the archeologists came in, began examining their bodies. They started so young as children shooting a bow and arrow that their left arm from holding the bow was impacted and had grown shorter and their right arm was longer from pulling the bowstring. So their arms were literally different lengths from shooting a bow so much from a little child up that they had grown that way to where they, could, they were literally built to use a bow. So this was the knowledge they had. You know, we, we, we had people uh, that, that have never shot a bow in their life. You know, they don't know what that's like. They, you know, they, you know, how does this work, right? So they understood these basic skills because they grew up with them. It wasn't, it wasn't foreign or strange to them. They also possessed primitive skills. So using horns, uh, by the way, cow horns, things like that, that was the plastic of the 18th century. That's how they made things. That's what they, they would heat it up and shape it and bend it and saw it and cut it and combs and, and, and the brushes and all kinds of things that, that could be made out of uh, handles. And all kinds of things besides powder horns and, 
and drinking horns and flasks and all of that stuff, right? They were they used horns a lot. They of course used a lot of leather, uh, from mostly from leather, leather they tanned themselves, and they knew how to tan hides and process. Of course, the wood that was around. They had a really good knowledge of how to use wood and all of the things that went along with that, including the various types of grains that you might work with and how that was best used in a tool. Uh, for instance. Most of the blacksmiths would sell an axe without a handle. <laughs> That'd be unthinkable today. You, you sell somebody an axe without a handle, it's just a head. And most people would say, I'm not buying an axe without a handle. It's incomplete. But back then, that's how it was sold because each person was understood to have the skills and abilities to make their own handle. Uh, in Michigan, for instance, back in the early part of the 20th century, when the timber cruisers, they would send a couple of guys out to mark the big trees, to get them ready for the timber company to come in, to do the logging. They would send them out with two axes. And the first axe, of course, was to cut down the tree, and the second axe was to cut down the tree that you needed to make the handle for the first axe, handle that broke. Right? Because if you just have a head, it's pretty hard to chop down a tree. You can do it, but it's very hard to make a good axe handle, so they would send them out, the timber cruisers, with two axes apiece so that they were able to literally process and make their own handles. And by the way, the modern fawn foot handle, which actually this is, I need to get it replaced. But you can see how this is curved and it's got this little fawn foot on it. It's called a knob at the end. This is, this is 20th century. This is not 18th century. 18th century handles were straight as a stick. They didn't have any curves in them at all. And I do have a handle at home uh, that needs to be put on. But obviously it's much easier to make a straight handle than it is one with fancy curves and all of that. And so they were people of their day, and they understood how to use this stuff. They understood how to, it's American hickory. They, and, and interestingly enough, we're, we're known for something around the world. Uh, American hickory handles on axes. You, know, you, buy, you buy axes from uh, Finland or, or Sweden or any of those places. You know, a Swedish axe will be sent to you in the United States with an American hickory handle on it because they're just great uh, it's a great piece of wood for the vibration and, and the action and, and to hold together. But again, you had to know what you're looking at. All right, moving on quickly here. The characteristics of 18th century survivors, and we've talked a little bit about some of this throughout, because some of it does overlap. First of all, they were hardened to the elements. They were hardened to the elements. We are very weak in our modern age. They were used to the sun, the wind, the rain, uh, the heat, the cold, being wet. Uh, they, they, they crossed rivers with their moccasins on, especially you get, you know, uh, some of these areas of the rivers, the Little Miami River was known by the French as, as La Riviere Roche, which means the, the rocky river because it's just stones everywhere. You didn't walk barefoot across something like that. You couldn't afford to get your feet lacerated, which meant you got your moccasins wet. If you get your moccasins wet, you better wear them till they dry, or you might never get them on again. Same thing is true for your buckskins. If you get your buckskins wet, wear them until they dry, or you might never get them on again. That leather will shrink up, and then, yeah, hopefully you have a, a younger brother you can pass them on to. A younger, skinnier brother. They were also used to fasting. They were not only hardened to the elements, but they were used to fasting. Ben Franklin said this, the Indians uh, will travel for and subsist on parched corn, taking only six or eight ounces of it per day mixed with water. So this, this corn that we talk about, the parched corn, uh, how important corn was, six to eight ounces of dried corn, that's not a lot. They would mix it with water, they would make a slurry or a paste. Uh, sometimes they would make cakes out of it and, and make ash cakes on a fire. You know, there are different ways they could make it. But they could literally live on that for a long period of time. Corn was a very important deal. And if you didn't have food, you went without. So hunger was not something that they, they feared it long term. But they understood that if things weren't around, you didn't eat. That's why the month of February... The month we're in right now is called the Starving Moon. 
They had, they had moon named for the moons of each one of the, of the months. But February is the starving moon. You know why? Because you've eaten most of what the, the bounty of the fall provided. Things haven't greened up yet. You're still waiting for those plants to blossom and bloom and, and, bloom and, and, and nothing's around. And so you're, you're just, if, if you didn't have a good harvest, you're literally a scavenger. There's not a lot of game out and about in this type of weather. So again, it's very, very hard to find food to eat. They were also used to drinking from open water sources. Um, if you go to undeveloped countries or underdeveloped countries, you will find that their people can drink and live on water that will make you sick. You know, you go down, for instance, just to Mexico, not that far below us, but they always tell you to visit Mexico, don't drink their water, only drink bottled water. Uh, when I've traveled overseas in different places, try to always do that. The people that live there that chug the water right down and have no problem because their bodies are adjusted to that. They're used to that environment. Our ancestors, they were used to drinking from open water sources. Also in the characteristics of 18th century survivors, they were motivated by liberty and self-direction. So even though they were in hard times, even though they may have been fasting, <laughs> this is the fancy word for starving, right? But they, they still were motivated. They, they had, many of them had come from either the crowded East or even many of them had, had em emigrated from Europe where it was crowded and dirty and, and a person, you know, uh, they could expect to spend their whole life in a sweatshop and, and live in a little flat and you, you had nothing at all to really show for your own. And if you came over here, you know, a, a man could work hard, could become something, could own a farm and you could actually better your future. For not only your wife and your children, but your, your, your posterity. And they thought a lot about posterity. They, they wanted to provide a better life for their children than they had. However, along with that though, the next point is that they, they also had lower expectations than you and I have. We are very pampered in the 21st century. We have a lot of things at our fingertips. Uh, keep on remembering that our, our ancestors could not just order something on Amazon and have next day delivery. They didn't have that sort of thing. Uh, they, they did not have the expectations that we do. Uh, we were talking uh, last night with Justin and I were hanging around the fire. And I said, you know, the average person doesn't understand how much effort it took just to put food on the table in the 18th century. And even in the 19th century. There was a lot of daily work on in the 20th century. I mean, we could, you know, it wasn't that many years ago where a person could work all day and, and a lot of times the, the men would be out in the field on a single bottom plow on a mule on the side of a hillside somewhere working literally all day long back breaking labor and the lady would be in the house you know, she'd be taking care of the kids she'd be cooking cleaning providing a canning you know all of the stuff that went with it it was it was a full-on effort all day long to put food on the table and we don't we don't think about it we think i'd like some popcorn go get a bag rip off the plastic Flip it up, get the side up, put it in on the glass, punch the popcorn button, and we sit there and fidget. I wish to hurry up, pop. Because we're going to stand there for the two minutes that it takes for it to actually do something. So they had lower expectations. Also, many of them were often already very poor. So they didn't, they didn't have an expectation of being served. Uh, at any rate, they, they might hope to serve a great person, to be next to someone who did have wealth and land, and they could better themselves, they could prove themselves, and, and perhaps, again, with, with service in the military, or so they might be able to get a land grant and, and have an opportunity to move forward. So they didn't have these great expectations because they grew up so poor that they were grateful. Uh, not anything, you, you hear about cabins that were so poorly constructed, people writing in the day. Uh, you know, there's one called 18th Century Travel Diary. Uh, a lady who was a business person who wrote about her travels and she came upon a poor family living uh, beside a creek and, and there was no chinking. Uh, they, they hadn't chinked the logs yet. And, and she said it was embarrassing. You, could, you, could, you know, they're, they're dressing and undressing and you could see through the logs. I mean, they're an extremely poor family and, and they, they just didn't, you know. Uh, another, another report talks about a, a guy who built his family a very rude log cabin and he didn't have any money for nails. And so they were living without a roof. And uh, this guy, he was kind to them, and he, he signed a bill. I forget what all happened, but uh, he, he helped them out by giving them uh, enough of, of credit to go down. Uh, he wrote a note for them so that they could go to the local blacksmith 
and, and get a couple of pounds of nails so they can put their shingles on their roof. So again, we, we, we don't think about how poor they were. That's the reason why they had lower expectations. By the way, they were often smaller than 21st century people. Uh, they say the average man's height in the in 18 uh, in the 18th century was about five foot five, three and a quarter. All right. So they say the average F-16 pilot's about five six. So you know, you're like Tom Cruise height, right? So they, they weren't real tall, weren't real big people. Uh, in 1847, I couldn't find any good 18th century stats for how much men weighed, but in 1847, so which is right around that time period and about 25 years later, they had stayed about the same, so probably pretty close. Men averaged 139 pounds. Women averaged 112. It seems to me that the men have gotten a lot heavier. <laughs> Uh, in, in our modern age. But again, they, they worked very hard. They were small in stature. And, and it amazes me when I go into museums and I see the clothes that they wore. Their, their shoulders were so narrow. Uh, they, they were such small people compared to what we are today. Uh, we, are, we are much larger, much more robust. And part of that's because of the food we eat. We do have better nutrition in some, in some ways. We definitely have better, better medical care. And one of the things that we can attribute our better health to is we have better plumbing. Uh, we have ways of dealing with waste that they didn't, which, again, helps us to live cleaner and longer lives. By the way, along with that, they also did not have much junk food. We are surrounded by sweets day in and day out. Uh, I mean, some person said that's why God gives you two sets of teeth, because you know, we can rot the first set out when you're a kid, right, on candy. But, you know, we, we think about how much we have available to us. What did they do if they wanted something sweet? Well, you have to go to a maple tree and drill a hole in it. You have to make a spile. You have to find some sort of a container to collect it in. And then you have to have some sort of a, of a boiling vessel because it takes 40 gallons of maple sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. And then you boil that down even further to get the actual sugar. So it was an expensive, time-consuming, long process. So needless to say, while they did have sugar and all of that, obviously that sugar cane and all of that in the 18th century, but it was not something that they did all the time. It was reserved for special events, for tea and things like that, and often more in the civilized areas. However, the frontiersmen did use sugar often to sweeten their chocolate. So they, uh, they were not unaware of that, and they did use it from time to time, but they didn't have a lot of junk food. Certainly didn't have potato chips, right, things like that. Uh, they were also raised on hard work from a child up, and they were not distracted by much news. Indeed, think of this. It has been said that in a single copy of the New York Times today, it would contain more news than a person might encounter in their entire life. I mean, the New York Times is a big newspaper. And it's got all kinds of events from all over the world. But still, imagine that. If you got a copy of today's New York Times, it would might very possibly have more news in that one copy than a person in these days would encounter for their entire life. Obviously, that would be different if you were living in Philadelphia, New York, and places like this where there was a lot of civilization and a lot of printers and a lot of news. But we're talking frontier, we're talking 18th century survival, people who are on the very verge of civilization who would be gone for months or even years before they would get back. You didn't hear a lot. So things changed. Um, they also prized fire. They really prized fire, and making it was a priority. It was the one skill that you really have to have is to make fire because without fire, you could die. It cooked your food, it boiled your water, it, it, it uh, you know, kept you, gave you light. And remember, they didn't have batteries, they didn't have flashlights. If, if, you, if you wanted light, then it was some sort of fire, whether it was an oil lamp or a candle or your campfire. Light in that day depended much on quail oil, of course, but it depended on being able to have a fire. So starting a fire was something that everybody knew how to do, and the better you could do it in this kind of situation like we have today, the better off you are. They were also quick to adapt to local conditions. Uh, that's one of the things you have to do. You know, the, the military, improvise, adapt, and overcome. 
But when you are in a survival situation today, as in the 18th century, they had to realize what was happening, just like as we heard about the general on the battlefield, and, and, and we're talking how the, the changing conditions on the ground, they had to adjust their strategy. And that same thing happened for the 18th century people. They would, they would run into different habitats where different things were available. All right. Uh, and finally here, they had two kinds of fire that they were concerned about. There's two kinds of fire. First of all, was the physical fire that you would start with wood and the fireplace or the candle or the Betty lamp or whatever it might be that you were, you know, using to light your home or cook with, whatever, right? But the second fire that was very important was the inner fire of body heat. And the Native Americans especially, they, they really, they really loved to, to, to keep that inner fire burning. Because if you're going to survive, we know it as keeping your core temperature stable. That, you know, we, we have modern terms for it right now, and uh, we, we understand that, like, like you know, your, your fingers and your toes and your ears and your nose, it's starting to get cold. That's your body pulling heat from the extremities to keep your core temperature where it needs to be within that proper range of average of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? So they understood you had to eat food and you had to prepare, prepare yourself and, and be really, really careful. And along with that, I have some things here uh, that I have that I have cut down, and so they were really concerned about about their kidneys. And there's all kinds of ways to do this, but they would just take a scrap of a blanket, and they would be very very careful, especially in cold weather. They, they would want to tie something around their, their their midsection, around their kidneys, to try and keep them warm. As a matter of fact, there was some captives. Uh, that were captured and, and they were they were complaining that, that they didn't have anything, they weren't given any scraps of blanket or anything to protect their kidneys from the cold. It was a big deal. And so that was one of the survival skills that they considered to be very important. And of course they would also have scraps of blanket to, to wrap their legs, to make leggings and different things to, to keep the inner fire. That's how you survived. Because if you got caught out in enemy territory, maybe you didn't have your fire making materials, maybe everything was wet, but if that inner fire burnt strong, by the way, there's a lot of lessons for us in the modern 21st century, keep the inner fire strong, right? When people lose that, they lose the ability to, to live, to work, to survive. Even in the modern world, we let that inner fire die out. So these are some of the characteristics of 18th century survivors. And the last thing I'm going to give you is a very short clothing list. There's 14 items on here. Most of this is familiar to you. Uh, there could be items you can add or take away depending on seasons. But this is just a very basic list. Of course, moccasins or boots, uh, depending on what kind of wilderness travel you were going to do, uh, or even shoes. Uh, a lot of them went barefoot, but if you could have foot gear, um, that's one reason why, of course, the natives made moccasins. Uh, breeches or a breech cloud and leggings. Of course, buckskin clothing. And then you would also have canvas uh, type clothing and from about 1789 on long pants became a little bit more of, of, a, of a popular item and, and the short uh, knee breeches started to disappear in style and so which is another reason why in 1794 I'm wearing full length uh, pants uh, which of course at that point would have been out uh, five years earlier. Wool socks, of course wool socks will keep your feet warm even if you're soaking wet it will keep you from having frozen toes uh, leg or knee ties, uh, very important. You had to have something, uh, something like a patella strap around the patella tendon. It's not just for decoration. Originally, they started off. Many of them were used to hold up their socks because they had long socks that came above their their knees or hosen, as they were sometimes called. But the other thing is they also developed this from the Native Americans and the French trappers. When you're walking long distances carrying heavy loads, if you can put a strap either above or below your knees, depending on where you want to stabilize that tendon, it can help you go long distances with less injury to the legs and knees. All right, they, had, they would have a shirt, uh, a Lindsay Woolsey shirt or a linen shirt, uh, some sort. Uh, of course, wool was very common back then, but uh, a person had to have clothes. Sometimes they would carry an extra shirt with them. Uh, depending on their wealth status and if they could afford it or if the woman at home was very industrious and she was good at the spinning wheel and the loom and could make their own fabric, then of course they would be able to have a little bit more clothes. Her family would be a little better dressed than the other family would be because of her abilities. 
uh, a waistcoat or a waistcoat, as we would say today, uh, was a very important part of a man's attire. And and by the way, suspenders were even in use. I, I have suspenders on to help hold my my pants up, but they were considered man's undergarments, and you didn't you didn't see them. And interestingly enough, in the 1870s, Mark Twain is one of the guys that made suspenders popular and actually uh, went on to uh, had a company that sold them. And it wasn't until the 1920s or 30s that a person, a man was allowed to walk around in public with his suspenders showing. I just thought that was really interesting. But it actually dates back hundreds of years, even back in the 18th century, they had suspenders, but it was a really big no-no for anybody to see them. So that would be covered. Your, your shirt would go on the bottom, your, your whisket, of course, and then uh, your suspenders if you had any on your pants. And then, of course, obviously your, your cravat was a very big deal. Uh, this is the, uh, the foundation of our modern neckties. But back then, it helped to protect the throat from weather. It also helped from sweating. You'll see Humphrey Bogart and a lot of those old actors in the 1920s and 30s, many of them wore a kerchief or some sort of a cravat uh, when they were working hard. Again, helps catch the sweat and the dirt and all of that stuff. And of course, when they got out west, the dust storms, and they could pull it up over the mouth and nose and cattle drives and things like that. Forest fires, very useful. A hunting frock, a great coat. Uh, they would have some sort of an outer layer, again, depending on their wealth and their status and their ability to uh, procure it. Uh, they would have some sort of a belt, uh, normally a wide leather belt, something that you could carry your gear on. A lot of early pants and clothing didn't have pockets. Now, they were in the process of developing all of this, but they, a lot of pants had no pockets. So where does a person carry something? Well, they carry it in their haversack or they carry it on their body, on their belt. And of course, your belt was where you carried your tomahawk, it's where you carried your belt knife, it's where you carried your possible's kit, and then all the little odds and ends of items that you would definitely want with you. Uh, you would have a hat. It was considered very important for a person to have a hat. Uh, you would have a, a, a daytime hat that you would wear around uh, that protected, protected you from the sun and maybe even from the rain, but they were very, very careful to protect their hat and their clothes. If a person became disheveled or they got a lot of holes in their clothes, we don't understand it today because we have people who go out and spend a hundred bucks on a pair of jeans that already has holes in it, all right? Be because that's in style. But back then, if a person was walking around with holes in their clothes, they would absolutely be disrespected by everybody except those who were in the gutter with them. You, you, even, even if you were as poor as a church mouse, you took very good care of your clothes. You tried to make sure that, if at all possible, you didn't have to patch them or mend them because patching or mending signs was, was a visible sign of your poverty. People could people judged you. Remember, these are class status. This is people, the elites, and all the way from all these verified uh, status levels of people in society. And so, as, as society was stratified, if you looked like you were a, a, a ragtag person, uh, it, it was something that you read about how when they, they got into town, how they, they were so, if, if they had any cash money, one of the things they would do, they would go to the, the trading post or the general store and they would, they would buy a new shirt. And, and how, how, how it made them feel so much better to be able to, to have a new shirt because it was, again, something that people looked at. Well, you know... You're, you're not on the bottom of the rung. You know, you're, you're not a drunk or you're not a, a ne'er-do-well, but you're someone who has some status. So it was a really big deal to maintain that. And along that with was your hat. You, if, you, if you got out in the rain with your, with your hat on, made from wool or, or all, they get wet, they get floppy, they get droopy and saggy, and, and nobody wanted to go around looking like that. So the hatter had a very big business, and part of his business was to reshape and reform your hat into something that looked respectable again. Because you didn't go places without your hat. And as a matter of fact, a lot of times in the 18th century, they wore their hats indoors. Uh, so you would have a hat, and then you'd also have something like a monolith cap. Uh, or a nightcap, something that you would put on your head that obviously you can't turn and roll around with a hat like this very good, but they would put a, 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 some sort of a nightcap on. And they, they slip with nightcaps and nightgowns, and, and you'll see pictures from that, that century uh, for cold weather and sleeping. But they also, of course, on the trail had minimal needs, and they weren't trying to impress anybody, but they would still have that, again, for sleeping and for other things. Um, also, they would have maybe some gloves, like fingerless gloves, uh, that would allow you that dexterity and yet keep your hands warm. Uh, they would have wraps, again, for their legs and their kidneys, usually uh, strips of an old blanket uh, that they would, you know, because they didn't waste anything. Uh, just because a blanket got too tattered to roll up and sleep in, you could take those strips of cloth and you could wind them around 
and, and keep using it. Uh, they might also have a heavy coat of some sort. Uh, sometimes it would be something from, if they were a Revolutionary War soldier, it might be a great coat left over from the war. It could be a buffalo coat. Uh, it could be anything like that, that that would really protect you from the weather. Maybe they had been a seaman, and they would have a seaman's cape or something like that for foul weather, a uh, sou'wester as it was called. You would have something like that sometimes made from oil cloth or oil skin. And then finally they might have a wool scarf uh, for their neck and to help hold the heat in and to keep them, uh, and, and even they would wrap it around the neck and over the head and around until they made almost, it made them look you know, like an like a 18th century ninja, right? They have just, just the eyes. Why did they do that? Well, again, they, they feared sickness and they didn't know how to deal with it and there was no guarantee when a person got sick that they'd ever recover from it. So they understood very much the importance, again, of keeping that inner heat keeping that inner fire in. So these are some things about 18th century survival.